Hi, so I'm Andrea Fawkes. I'm a past life regression expert, intuitive visionary, and I work weaving between past lives, inner child healing, ancestral timeline healing. And I'm today talking, very excited to talk to um, Curtis Childs, who is part of the Emmanuel Swedenborg Foundation. And I have a really amazing connection to share with Curtis that he doesn't know about linked to the Emmanuel Swedenborg Foundation, but more actually linked, I think, to Emmanuel Swedenborg himself. So I've been doing past life regression for 22 years in the UK. And I do have some people who know about my work in Sweden. And one day somebody messaged me saying, a Swedish astrologer has compared my birth chart to Emanuel Swedenborg's birth chart. But the bizarre thing is I already knew somehow who Emanuel Swedenborg was. And I think I came across his books maybe at the College of Psychic Studies in London many, many years ago, um, because he was a great mystic from, well, he was born, wasn't he, in 1688 and he died in 1772. Um, right. What I love about Emanuel Swedenborg is that he was having mystical experiences probably before that many people were really talking about them and it was unusual for a man to talk about them and then the Emanuel Swedenborg Foundation you contacted me on a particular day back in March this year and it was actually when I looked the birthday of Emanuel Swedenborg so <laughs> I felt like it's obviously meant to be that we're meant to connect on this day so I'm super excited to talk to you. Thank you so much yeah that, that I didn't even think about it but that's a great coincidence there and um yeah that that's really cool to get to hear a little bit about your past connection it makes total sense if his books were in that that school in london he put, did a lot of his publishing out of london at the time they they had as you said it was unusual to talk about spiritual experiences and there's only a couple places that had the, the freedom of the press where you could go and do that and so he would spend time in london and amsterdam publishing so it's very good to meet you Thank you and you and I do know that I believe that I'm right did he pass away in London did he did he yes actually, yeah and was he actually buried in London as well um yeah that that's, a bit... that's 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 a little beyond what I've got in my head I know that I know that there was some drama after he was buried somebody oh. stole his head stole oh, really? his skull like so he dug it up and stole it there's a little a little um like a plaque i have like an article about that but i i can't i don't remember if i thought his maybe his he may have died in london but but eventually he was moved back to sweden but but don't quote me i, I can google it afterwards but i'm not wow. totally sure so oh my goodness that's a great way to start that someone stole his skull after he was buried wow i know right yeah so people do all kinds of things and so a, a lot of people talk about him because he was connected to talking about angels for 40 years, which, you know, yeah. probably for the time he lived in was super unusual to be a man also talking about angels as well. And and not just a man, but he was a famous scientist. I so, love that. Up. Can you tell us about what he was? Yes. Thinking? Well, yeah, why, part of why I feel like Swedenborg would be of such interest to your followers and, and anybody who's interested in anything spiritual is that he really represents not only an an early um, instance of recorded spiritual experiences. I mean, now we have a lot of freedom in the culture to talk about it. A lot of people are, I think about like when Raymond Moody came out with um, Life After Life, the near-death experience phenomenon, There's there's been... Um, uh, mediumship is uh, people are pretty used to that but back in in six in the mid 1700s when he was doing this that that was not the norm to, to record spiritual experiences and also for somebody who was where he was so Swedenborg was a, a I would say like a genius because he was uh, at the leading edge of almost everything so but back then, you know, science was a little simpler than it is now. You really could sort of be an expert in multiple fields. And he was. He was he you know published these seminal works on anatomy. He was well well trained in anatomy. He like founded some scientific branches like crystallography. He brought the first scientific journal to Sweden. He was um all, but not just with science, he was also an inventor and an engineer. 
He he was the assessor of mines for Sweden's mining industry, which oh, at wow. the time, yeah, at the time, the mining industry was a huge industry and Sweden was like a major power. So he's a very important position. And he w- had invented machines and contraptions that allowed people to, uh, you know, excavate materials more efficiently. So he was doing that. He had, he also um, had involvement in Sweden's government. He was in the House of Nobles. He's actually, his name was Svedberg, or I think as you'd pronounce it in Swedish, (laughs) Svedberg, but then he got ennobled and became Swedenborg. So, so he was, he was, um, all, all, sorry, my watch was just talking to me for a second. Um, he, so he was, he was a big deal. He was a big enough deal that when he would travel, let's say from Stockholm to London, the papers would say Emanuel Swedenborg has arrived. He he was he was kind of a rock star scientist, sort of like a, a Neil deGrasse Tyson or something. Now, like who, whoever a famous scientist is, so for him to come out and say, "I've started to have these spiritual experiences, and I'm going to write about them for the rest of my life, and and take the same scientifically trained mind that I had on all these other subjects, and use that to try to explain clearly and rationally how." the afterlife works it was a big deal and people reacted kind of how you would expect so some people thought oh this is so cool a lot of people thought you're you're crazy you you lost your mind and, and yeah. did i read that it affected his career in the scientific realms by him talking about this i don't know if i read something about yeah. that well i i think most people haven't heard of swedenborg no they haven't and I think you would people if he had never done this talking to spirits thing. I think a lot more people would have heard of him because he would the the, the I, I feel like the importance he had in his scientific discoveries. He's still like he has this uh, the nebular hypothesis, which is a way that galaxies form. That's still taught in textbooks and th- but but I think if he had not kind of gone off the deep end, as people think, I think that you would just know him as a scientist. Like, oh, yeah, there was not not like maybe to the extent of a Newton, but it'd be like, oh, yeah, Swedenborg, he made these important discoveries. But because he started to do this, oh, yeah, he lost all kinds of credibility. He had some people who who, who embraced what he was writing publicly, but some people, you know, were just mocking him. Some famous people, Immanuel Kant and, and uh, even William Blake. Uh, they they who they they had kind of a mixed relationship, maybe even private. They were a little more into it, but publicly they had to say this is nonsense. The church didn't like it either. And wasn't he was, his father yeah. a Luther Lutheri? Am I saying it wrong? Yeah, Lutheran. Yes, priest, a, pri- a minister. How would you? Is that correct? He was a, he was a bishop, a Lutheran bishop, oh, which wow. was so not just a priest. So he was up there. Yes, and. Um, he had, I think he had died by the time that Swedenborg was doing this publishing, but at the time in Sweden, it was a religious government. So you couldn't, there's, if you went against church doctrine, that was going against the state. Mm -hmm. And he did, he actually, toward the end of his life, Swedenborg's, his works were put on trial. There was a trial in Gothenburg, I believe, where they, they were, um, he was fine. He he was pretty well connected. He wasn't really, I think, in danger of go, going to prison over it. But but this just shows that he was actually breaking convention on all sides. So it was for a scientist to say that there are spirits and angels and you can talk to them and I am talking to them was like, no, you nobody does that. But then also to say, I've seen the afterlife and here's some things about it that are wildly different than what the Christian churches saying that was so he was kind of getting it on all sides. Some people liked it. And I think I think now a lot more now, a lot of the things he was saying are are coming to be self-evident. Like for One of the things that he got in trouble for was he was saying that, um, well, he's saying heaven and hell are like states of mind primarily rather than that it's not defined by places in the afterlife. Hell is not this place of punishment that God has created to you know, it's like not like a big cosmic jail for people. And heaven is not just, well, if you get let in, then you're happy that heaven and hell are states of mind. So heaven fundamentally is the pleasure that you get out of doing something 
useful for someone, someone doing something good for someone, helping somebody, that that is the basis of what heaven is. So when you're, when you're intending to do what's right because it's good, the joy that you can get out of that, that is like the foundation of what heaven is. And then hell is the pleasure you get out of harming someone or, or taking advantage of someone or something like that. So these are what heaven and hell are. And there, there is in the afterlife, there's, there are, you know, what you love kind of determines where you are and yeah. who you associate with and everything like that. So you do have these big kind of gatherings that you could, that he calls heaven and hell, but it's by based on what your state of mind and heart is. And he said that you don't have to be Christian to go to this heaven state, which that was like, that was going against the entire teaching of Christianity. So there's a lot of things that he said that people uh, were, I think, not ready for. Yeah. And I think it also is quite interesting because I think the people I'm going to mention now probably came later than him. Like there was a lady called Estelle Roberts in the UK. Like a lot of these names have just gone in the mists of time. But you yeah. know, I've seen books about a lady called Estelle Roberts and she used to fill out the Royal Albert Hall giving seances in the Royal Albert Hall. And then people like, you know, everyone knows um, Sherlock Holmes, but not everyone really knows about um, Arthur Conan Doyle who wrote, you know, all these books. But again, he was a great mystic and it was like in their time, all this stuff had to be kind of a bit hidden because it yeah. was affecting their other careers. And yet I think probably with Swedenborg as well, I think that perhaps the reason they were able to tune into all this, you know, be such an amazing mind was because of their mystical sides. Yes, I, I think so. And even... Swedenborg, it's not like when he started to have these spiritual experiences. He described it as having your spiritual eyes opened. Like you, we, we all have a spirit and a body, according to him. And your spirit has like senses, just it, it can see things, it can hear things. But usually it's it's shut down because we're so focused on what's going on with the body. So when he when he felt like his spiritual eyes were opened, um to him how old this... was he how old was he when he started saying he was having these experiences i think he was f mid 50s i think it was like 54 55 and it actually started in dreams well he and and the cool thing about sweden work for anybody who's interested in anything spiritual is it's so well documented because even even his transition from going to be going from being a, a regular person. I mean, he did, he did reportedly have some, a few experiences, like when he was a little kid, he would run in and say to his parents, I've been talking to angels out in the garden. So, so it's not like he, he had nothing, but he, he certainly wasn't having regular experiences, but he goes from being that to being somebody who was having daily experiences for these, for the 30, 40 years at the end of his life. But he's keeping a journal of his dreams during the time that that happened. And it, it's, it started as um, a travel journal. So he was just saying, I, I went from Stockholm to um, Amsterdam. And that, because travel back in those days was, it was hazardous and it was arduous and you, you needed to mark it and he's keeping track of his life or whatever else was going on in there. And then he starts to write his dreams down and he starts to, first he starts to try to analyze his own dreams. So he'll say, for example, there was a black dog that kept coming up in his dreams. And he was, as he was going through this, what he felt like was a process, he was seeing that oh, that's a symbol of his pride. Because he was so good at everything, he was yeah. like arrogant and he was self-centered. And, and he, he, he believed that he was superior to other people because of how talented he was. And he was having to face that. And this dog in his dreams kept trying to bite him and he was having to push it. And oh. he, he started to, to analyze it and say, oh, this is what's going on here. And this was, that was way before there was Sigmund Freud or, or, you know, any kind of organized dream interpretation. But during, so he's recording his dreams, he's analyzing them, but they start to get more and more vivid and meaningful. And, and then he documents how they start to, he starts to have experiences in like in the hypnagogic state or like right when he's waking up and then they move into being what he calls uh, s experiences in a state of full wakefulness. So this is, I'm not dreaming. I can really see this. He, he talks about the first time a spirit ever talked to him and, and what it said. So he, it goes just day by day. It's, it's not, it's not a super or long. Was he account, seeing but, them or just a sense of, of um, seeing them. 
see, so he's seeing them. By the time that that he got, um, oh, sorry, do you have a? I was going to say, what, does does he in the books describe how he saw them, what they physically looked like to him? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so by the time, um, by the time that he got like into his full blown spiritual phase, he was having uh, the whole spectrum of experiences uh, regularly. So everything from um, full on traveling like i'm he's out of his body he's in the spiritual world and he can go around and talk to the people that are there and see the places where they live and like he, like he's out like he's out so he's From like that, remote viewing by today's like, standard yeah yes remote viewing um or or um astral projection or well, you know so he would yeah. he would do that sometimes but there's also times when it would be like a, a mixed reality so he would be let's say writing uh, his books and at the same time he could hear sometimes just hear or sometimes see and hear the spirits around him reacting to what he was doing so they they would say like he would say like the spirits didn't want me to write this thing or or they or these angels were telling me that this is true so it'd be kind of both at the same time or he'd be at a party or something with people that in the physical world and yet know at the same time how the spirits reacted or he'd be He'd be walking down the street. And I remember he talked one time about he was walking down a street. I think it was in, I mean, it was probably in London. And he saw some kids fighting each other. And there was actually a crowd of people that had gathered around them, were kind of egging them on. And he was talking about how the angels with him were horrified that this was happening and that parents would be encouraging their kids to, to do this kind of thing. So he would, there, there you would have, both worlds kind of going on simultaneously. He even talked about it depends on what kind of spirits were with him. So if it were spirit and for him, spirits are all like people who have died, people who lived yeah. at some point and then and then have died. So but the kind of personality or mind that you had affected how they affected him. So there were certain spirits that when they were with him and he'd be walking down a street somewhere, they would always try to turn his attention to anything that was gross or dirty. So in, in those days, there was, you know, there were people would kind of dump their refuse out the window. So there'd be gross stuff around. And when these spirits were with him, they were always trying to get him to look at that stuff. And because it, because it kind of resonated with the, their negative point of view. Other times though, he would have, um, you know, kind, benevolent spirits with him and they would get, they would, they would be attracted to the, the kinder, gentler things in life. So you'd have those, there'd be times when it would be just sort of phenomena. He would, he said that he had, when he was writing, there would be a flame, like a, a light that was there and it would change color based on whether what he was writing was accurate or not. Um. So, so anyway, and he, he keeps that little dream journal, which is just over the course of, I, I think like half a year or so. But then from there on out, he he keeps what's called what's what's now translated as journal of spiritual experiences and this goes throughout many years of his life i think it's i think it's four volumes and it's just like the raw data of what his experiences were and it you know sometimes he'll he'll have that that um you know um negative spirits will come and be sort of attacking him and it'll affect his body in different ways it'll cause pain in different parts of his body or so so it's it's like all of the above and this is all this like journaling is behind, is in addition to the actual books he wrote and published which are much more organized and and drawn in a lot of ways from those but so i all this is just to say he was having like all the different kinds of experiences he even one time the last thing i'll say is that when he talks about he has one number in his i think journal of spiritual experiences where he talks about these four different kinds of experiences that that he's had and he says once or twice, just so I could be shown what it was like, he had an experience where he was walking through a city, like in the in the physical world. And then he went into a spiritual experience where he went off into the spiritual world somewhere and was talking to angels and spirits. And and when he came back his to his physical body, it was on the other side of the city. Like it had been walking kind of on yeah, autopilot. Yeah, right, right. So, <laughs> so it, it had been going along it, it, on its business while he went and did this so as, as i said and, and he'll describe he'll describe absolutely we'll talk about 
the way that spirits look. And I could get into that uh, if you want or, or or anything, but there's there's so much material there. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm fascinated by, and I, th- I don't know how many books he's written, but I get the impression he was prolific in what he wrote. And so I'm interested in your experience and also my experience and how that merges with what he wrote, because, you know, I think I'm a tiny bit older than you, but I've been <laughs> I've been awake for 22 years and I hadn't really read any spiritual books when I had my awakening. So from my perspective, I was having my mystical experiences from a real naivety where I hadn't really been influenced by other work. And I yeah. know that that case doesn't happen for everyone. So I'm even more interested in his experience because I'm working on the theory that in his time, there probably wasn't any stuff for him to read about angels or anything like that, or probably even very many people who would have even had that conversation with him. So he was probably right, you know, out there on his own, having these experiences. And I'm wondering how many people did he have to talk to this about? Did he have any friends who had mystical experiences that he could share this information with? And in my experience, going back to what you were saying, I wonder if, because what I see in regression when I take people into into past lives and I take them to that what I call the between life state as well, where they may, you know, experience these, I call them benevolent beings. I maybe used to call them angels, but now I call them benevolent beings. And I allow the client to have their experience of what they perceive it as instead of me projecting it onto them. Yeah. But I think that it depends on your emotional state. And it sounds like what you're saying is that Swedenborg was wrecked by the sounds of it, correct me if you think I'm wrong, wrecked with sort of guilt about his own ability to have so many skills and gifts and maybe he became quite self-critical and that maybe from a vibrational state allowed his vibration to lower a bit and in that in those times maybe when he was in a lower state of consciousness in his own being was maybe when he was having these experiences with the lower vibrational beings and when he was in a more higher state he was having maybe the more angelic experiences what do you feel? Yeah. Oh, well, I appreciate getting to hear a little bit about um, sort of where, what your journey has been. I, I definitely think that he didn't have a lot, if anyone, to talk to about this or or that had had. Ha- yeah, I don't think there was a lot of widespread literature about it. He never remarks about having any friends or anyone he knows personally Wow. who have had those kinds of experiences. He'll he'll reference it generically. He'll say, oh, people do have these experiences. Sometimes when when you're if if you're alone and lost in thought, you can hear a spirit talking to you. But he never says, or, or and there's no let records of any letters to anyone who uh, was having the same kind of experiences. He even says at one point in uh, I can't, I can't remember which book, but he says that he he was f- forbidden to read other spiritual material because he needed to just do exactly what you did so um yeah and he he was very prolific he wrote um since after his spiritual awakening he wrote 30 volumes of wow. of text and that's that doesn't include the journal of spiritual experiences the the dream diary that he wrote many more probably about 10 volumes that he didn't end up publishing but that, that are so he was absolutely a a writing machine on all that. And this was back when you you don't just type up a book and then send it to your editor. You had to write the entire thing by hand with a dip of feather in ink and write it. And then you had to, after you've written it and cross-referenced and everything, you had to write a fair copy, which is write the whole thing again, but really legibly so that you can send it to the, with, with no marks and notes or anything, so you can send it to the printer and then they can finally print it. So, so he was, do, you know, absolutely... It's, I think it speaks to how important he felt like this was. And that he was just, he, yeah. Did he set up his own publishing company or, or did he find someone willing to publish his work? He he, he found someone willing to publish and there, there's records of who it was. There was, um, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't have a, I'm not great at knowing who that, there was a woman in uh, London who was helping him, then another publisher there. He would publish he he couldn't find anyone in Sweden who would do it because you you weren't allowed to do it. So right. he went to oh, pred- it was, banned. was it was it banned in Sweden? Well, it was it was not uh, yeah you could you weren't allowed to publish what he was publishing. He and he wasn't allowed to for a long time, even import 
his books back into Sweden because so because of the content. Is that why he came to London then? Yeah, that's uh-huh. right. There was there was two places that he published out of. One one was London and one was Amsterdam. And we went to both of those places because they had this freedom of the press that allowed him to do it. Also in London, there was this place called uh, Preternaster Row, which was like the happening spot for publishing at the time. It was where all the major publishers were. So he went there to try to get things out into the world. He was paying for the publication of it out of his own pocket. And he said, he told the publisher that if he, if the books ever sold that the publisher could keep the money, like he wasn't in it to make the money And Swedenborg. It, that's a nice thing to do, but also he, he had enough of a, a wealth that he could live independently. So because he was, he had had his career and what was a noble and stuff. So he could survive just fine, but he wasn't trying to, build his fortune off the books and the books never sold that well anyway and he he talks about it in letters that he wrote that there's one that he's writing to a, a friend and saying yeah i've i think he said i've heard from angels that we've we've only sold four copies this month or something oh. of, of secrets <laughs> of heaven and he's like in, so he did he cared very much about getting things out so he did shift strategies he had started with um publishing Secrets of Heaven, which is this really dense, technical, long, it's 15 volumes in English translations, it's 11 in the original Latin work. <clears throat> and that it was very hard to get people interested in that. They, they tried a few ways, but people started to be interested more. Just tell us your spiritual experiences. Don't tell us like how it all works and everything like that. So he published his best-selling book, Heaven and Hell, which was full of spiritual experiences and and but also was always pointing back to his other books like he had those footnotes at the bottom that's like so you, you want to know are you saying he wrote that in latin and then it was translated every everything he wrote was in latin because latin was the language of the educated at the time so it was more of a universal what year, language what year was that um heaven and hell was 1758 so the, and that was Heaven and Hell. He yeah he published a number of works in 1758, but they included Heaven and Hell, and that was after he'd finished this phase where he's publishing Secrets of Heaven. But you were you were asking before about um, the vibration levels and and what why was he encountering you know positive and negative mm-hmm. beings, and it seems like he was given sort of like a a a learner's pass or something like a backstage pass so that it, there, he said that he was given access to all kinds of things so that he could record them so when he would have his um negative experiences he he was always safe like he he felt like i he would say he was during the beginning of his spiritual transformation there was a little more disruption and he had these sort of dark nights of the soul that that are part of how his awakening came about but after that he would describe these these scary things happening, but he'd say, hey, like, I knew I was safe, but this was happening so that I could learn it and record it and, and write it down. And same thing even with the the positive things. So he was he he definitely felt like he wasn't just wandering. He had a a mission, which was to tell people about spiritual reality because so many people had had fallen away from that and also correct a lot of misconceptions that the church had that the, the church was in particular, there's a couple of things that he felt like the church was teaching people that were really causing problems. And one of them was this idea of what he called faith alone. So it was this thought that if you have religious teachings and you check a box and say, I'm, I'm Christian and I go to this church, um, that that's what it was. That, was all that mattered. So then people would be doing that and yet be living terrible lives, being cruel to each other, being uh, mean and heartless and thoughtless. And the, the the pursuit of spirituality was not linked to love. Like faith had gotten separated from love. And he thought that this, this was causing great damage because it made the religious organizations or spiritual organizations didn't have any power to to make things better because because that that had gotten severed. So to him that was really important. It was also to to re- give people insight into the reality of the spiritual world, because at that time there was a lot of people who thought 
you asked before about what form do spirits take back in his day um there was a lot of thought that if it's not physical it it barely exists so maybe the consciousness survives but it's in this you're just kind of like a puff of air and you maybe you can't even see things but he was trying to say no there's a there's an a, there's an afterlife and it's more real than this and there's your people there you you can talk to people you can still do things like that, that it's real and it's 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 more real than this that was it that was kind of lost to the human race i think now the idea it's even it's in popular culture if you're in a if it's a movie and somebody you know dies for a little bit and they'll what was that show the good place that was on recently the idea that oh there's an afterlife that where there's real people in real places is kind of everywhere but back in his day that was people didn't know people didn't know so he was trying to um, wake people up to a couple of what he felt like were key principles and also i think you covered the thing that even today you know i hear this with clients and other people who are on their spiritual path and then i want to ask another question about relationships and was he married did he have children yeah even in today's society when i'm talking to clients you know and especially the last couple of years you'll have men or women who are my clients saying but my partner doesn't necessarily have these mystical spiritual experiences yeah when you talked about you know did he have friends to talk to then the other thing even in today's society and I don't know if you come across that but it's like people say they're still fearful will I be appeared to be insane by having these mystical experiences so back in the day I think oh my goodness how did this affect his relationships did he have a wife did he have children how did it affect those relationships and are we still in you know we're talking now in 2022 but you know I can't imagine in the mid 1700s how you were dealing with your mystical experiences and relationships yes i i know how to keep those two (laughs) things balanced and even even like when people will even just spiritual beliefs people will come to watch videos on our channel and they'll they'll get really into it and there's oh this idea that there are spirits and there is a well and they'll say all my family thinks i'm weird for getting into this you know i don't have any friends to talk to about this so i think that's that that's that can be a a condition that that like everybody goes through who touches anything spiritual. So Swedenborg was never married or had kids. Oh, okay. he, he had he had um. There was I think early in his life there's somebody who he wanted to was pursuing, but I think she wasn't into it, and he didn't. But that but he was very adamant in his writing that. Um, relationships are incredibly important and that uh, even even um, the marriage relationship, he talked about how when pe- if people are married and love each other, even if they die, they can they that bond sur- can survive death and they can still be together. And this was actually something that um, people did come to him and say, oh, you know, my my husband or wife died and are, are they still there do they still care about me and that he he t- he talked about how that when when one partner dies the spirit of the one who's died can actually be be dwelling or with the one who who and hasn't died give, yet would he give messages to people who he felt trusted his mystic he, gifts yes it, it seems like he did there's actually a couple of of uh documented accounts of that if if you just go to his Wikipedia page, the, the, there's a couple of uh, events that that were were corroborated by people. So there were the most famous, I think, is the um, the Stockholm fire. So he was at a party, and there was a it was like nobility and pe- people were all there. He was traveling. He wasn't at his home in Stockholm. I don't remember exactly where he was, but. He was at this party and suddenly people noticed that he was looking distressed and they were saying to him, what's wrong? What's wrong? And he said, there's a fire that just broke out in my hometown. And the reason that was remarkable is because it was several days journey to his hometown and there was no cell phones or tele. There's, it's not the kind of thing that he could have known. And so people were saying, well, that's weird. What, what are you talking about? There's a fire. And then a little bit later, he looked relieved and he said, it's okay. They put it out three houses down from my house and all of his writing and stuff was there. So he would have, would have lost everything he was working on. And so people kind of shrugged it off. But then a couple of days later, when 
word came in, it was exactly as he had described. So that wasn't like, that wasn't a personal thing, but there were other accounts that were. One of them was actually with a queen who who had, had heard that he'd had some mystical experiences and and was was like skeptical but curious and so she had she asked him to tell her something and it doesn't what what it was wasn't recorded but it was something that her de- her brother had died recently and Swedenborg told her something that only her brother could have known and so that made a huge impact Which on her. Which queen was that? Yeah, that I, I'd have to look it up. Um, but it's I think I think even that one's in his Wikipedia page. Wow. There was another another encounter though where there was a a woman who who was I think just an acquaintance of his, who her husband had died, and because of that she was going to lose her home. There was going to be all kinds of financial problems. There was a one document that she needed to to retain ownership of it, but she couldn't find it anywhere. And Swedenborg went and, and told her where it was, and she found it, and it was able to save things. So there was certainly there was certainly times when he would give messages to people. He, I'm sure it happened a bunch in his personal life that we don't hear about. He did record in letters a few times uh, where he would you know, tell people a few things about what was going on. He also um, would write in his journal <clears throat> uh, accounts of how people he knew were doing in the afterlife. He says that I, he said, I've talked to like everyone that I've known in, in my life. And he would talk about both just um, people that were, were friends and, and other members of the nobility, but he also talked about church leaders. And he would say, look, some of these ideas that you guys have, they they are really causing you problems in the afterlife because this this stuff where you've you've taken the love out of out of religion it it doesn't just go away like it, it's, it's still there in your mind and it causes you all kinds of problems so he's trying to he's really trying to warn and change church leadership and academics as well because he would say that people who had people like himself who were very educated would often be so resistant to spiritual ideas because this was a you know this is enlightenment times when wow science can really figure everything out and that you once you got this idea that there's nothing beyond what i can sense physically and especially if you are smart and you can marshal a bunch of arguments to that and especially if it gets wrapped up in your sense of pride like uh, look at these these silly people that believe that there's something non-physical there would be people who would go into the afterlife and still be clutching onto that so much that they would not believe that there was an afterlife even when they're in the afterlife. Yeah. So he was trying to to warn people that what what you believe and what you think and and, and what you care about it stays with you. Like we're, we're so so hey we can it's like it's like saying eat better food. This is like think better thoughts. You know feel yeah. you know care about better things. And I see that in my experiences. And then I want to hear about your experiences mm. of how you, you got into Swedenborg or how you even got on your own mystical experiences. And I know when you talked about the people from the afterlife, I'm actually going to speak to another friend of mine about angels after this, after we finish speaking. But we, her and I were having a conversation that we recorded on YouTube the other day. And we were talking about angelic experiences. And I don't necessarily see them, but I can sense them and I was talking about having an experience once of meditating and my hand was being held by you know well the being said it was Archangel Gabriel and it was it was a beautiful experience because it ties in with exactly what you're saying about Swedenborg it was showing me everybody who'd passed over and I've known a lot of people in this lifetime who've passed over for for my age I've known a whole plethora of people who've passed over. But when this angel was holding my hand, I couldn't pull my hand down, but it was also showing me everybody who'd passed over, but also energetically, the 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 thing that I gained from my interaction with them when they were in a physical incarnation. And then it also showed me, um, and I'm single in this lifetime and don't have children. And I find a lot of people who end up, not everyone, because you can't say that's an absolute truth, but I find a lot of mystical people do end up almost just forging their own path in such a way that it's hard for anyone to, almost I would say, keep up with them maybe, for them to stay true to their own inner 
journey and what's happening to them. So I also, while I was being shown these people who passed over, I was shown all these people I dated and also the part that I'd learned from my interaction with them. Yeah. And what it brought to me was this place of absolute joy, peace and grace you know, so you can reside within yourself in this more graceful experience. But I think what Swedenborg experienced, which I've experienced too, is in general, I stay at a certain vibration of consciousness, but things can happen that make your consciousness lower. And then you've got to work through that experience to increase your frequency again. So when you were on your mystical path, you were saying your dad's Swedish, but you, you live in America. So when did you open up or did you always have mystical experiences? Okay, I have a few things. One, I, I, I love, uh, again, getting to hear about your journey. So uh, that, that was a cool, cool feeling uh, that I got just hearing about holding that angel's hand and seeing the good that came out of everything, which Swedenborg calls um, divine providence. Okay. He says that, that, that divine providence is like the operation of the divine in life. And that, that while sure painful things happen, that divine providence will not allow anything to happen that good does not ultimately come out of. And so that was a really cool description of that that yeah here's all these people that you've interacted with here's all these people that you've known and here's the the good that's come out of them and that's also a very spiritual world way to see something that that uh, that all this stuff can be presented to you in a way that you can grasp that that was something that Swedenborg encountered all the time and this was way before there was anything like graphics or video and he was saying that everything that's talked about there can be represented so there, there's, he would talked about representations that would go along with speech. So when you're talking about something, you're also displaying like a picture or a, an, an image bunch about it. And um, now, oh yeah, that makes sense because I, I get what it's like to, there's all these YouTube videos where somebody's talking and beside them, there's low graphs and things that are explaining it or, or there's, there's ways of cleverly, but there was nothing like that back then so so i just loved getting to hear that and, and what a cool message for all of our lives that that there's it's not just oh everything's fine but here's the little bits of how this turned into good and what what the good was behind it, the hidden operation of the good in it so so i love that and thank, thanks for getting to for sharing that with me um so my my journey is i i actually don't i don't have mystical experiences I, okay. I have, I have, I am um, totally indebted to other people who have theirs and, and tell people about it. So, I mean, I've like, I've had a few things like here and there. I mean, I've, I've had some dreams that I felt like were important to me and, and were something beyond. Um, but mainly it's been through encountering people who have written about their near-death experiences that I've begun to see life in this way. And for me, it, where I really got attached to Swedenborg, I'd always known about him um, because my parents were readers of Swedenborg. And so I, I knew it was around, but it was when I was when I was like 19 or, or 18. And I really started to have my first struggles with depression. I had depression and anxiety and I, I was obsessive compulsive and just everything was was bad and 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 all these like racing thoughts and negative feelings and all these like deep fears and I I didn't know what it was called or or what it was and it was sort of af as I was trying to wade through that and figure out my life that it really clicked for me that oh Swedenborg is telling you how your mind works and that the spirit understanding the spiritual world and its influence that makes sense of why our minds are the way they are and why our lives are the way that they are. And I was finding that that was what was giving me comfort and it was always constructive when it came in. Um, so, the, and this is kind of, this is, this is part of how I, I benefit from other people's spiritual experiences and their teachings is like, ah, uh, there's this, there's this Christian story, the story in the Bible of uh, Jesus is like in the boat, with the disciples and they are there's a storm and there's all these waves in the wind and they think they're going to sink but jesus is asleep in the boat and they're like wake up can you save us save us and so he jesus is like be still 
and and the weather all stops and everything calms down. And they say this line at the end that I always think of, which is, who is this that the wind and the waves obey him? So I, I haven't had a spiritual experience where I can confirm for myself, but when I look at what, let's say, Swedenborg wrote, and he says, this is how this, or even what you were saying there, this, this is all the good that gets brought out of all these things. And when that comes into me and the wind and the waves in my heart and mind lie down, like all the anxiety and the trouble that I had before, that makes me say, well, what is this? This has got to be something. So just like that recognition of this is the truth. Yeah, because I think <clears throat> what he's probably saying, and probably they didn't have, obviously didn't have the vocabulary to explain it. He's sort of really talking about quantum physics. And, you know, there's great people that I love now. I don't know if you've come across their work, like people like Dan Winter, who hmm. speak about this <clears throat> more in a technical aspect. But I mean, I've had these experiences. I speak something called light language, which is like this sound healing. And I've stood once in the water at the at the beach. Well, many times I've done this, but the first time is is always the most powerful because it's from I always love it when it's from naivety. So um, and that's what I love about Swedenborg is everything he's talking about is from total naivety of not having any preconceived ideas of anything. And I was stood there singing my light language, and there were these guys surfing. And then all of a sudden the wave stopped and they couldn't surf anymore and they're looking really bewildered. And so, you know, in today's terms, we'd say, oh, you were a weather shaman, you know, you changed the weather. And we do have those skills and gifts. And I think what Jesus is talking about is that similar thing that your emotional state creates a certain reality or a dimension that you exist in. And it sounds like Swedenborg was was figuring all this out you know without having anyone to reference it with he uh, it was got to the point where people would people who are on ships that he would travel on would be like oh yes swedenborg is on this ship because it was word got out that the weather was always good when he was when he was on your boat oh, when he was word. going places yeah so he he yeah he would had he uh, cool? would that that's what we'd call the morphogenic field so <clears throat> his vibration would be affecting the morphogenic field and then i suppose like you said word got out so once the word gets out he's affecting the morphogenic field of all the travelers as well and then everyone's right. having a better experience yeah yeah that's right that's <laughs> it's so cool to think about hey can i can i ask you a question yeah um it's I'd love to hear a little bit more about what it's, you said you can sense these, these benevolent or, or angelic presences. What Can you walk me through a little bit of it? Like, what's that like? What's the experience of it? Yeah, so I had my big first awakening, ironically, in London, in Sloan Gardens of all places. So not too far from where the, because it's where's the, the Swedenborg Institute still exists in London, doesn't it? There, there is a yes. There is a Swedenborg Institute there, which yeah, I've I've been there. Um, and I'm I'm not sure what part of London it is, I but think it's like it's near yeah. Euston. If yeah. anyone wants to go, you just look it up. But I think it's near Euston Station, so it's that center of London. So I think it's quite interesting that you know I had my awakening in the center of London. I was levitating. You know, I can't levitate on demand, but I do believe that we are possible to lose the the density of our body and levitate and have those experiences so I was having those experiences at the time I was getting these connections like I said with Arthur Conan Doyle, Sir Oliver Lodge, um, Wesley Tudor Pohl which is the guy who set up the chalice well because I live in Glastonbury and so I think they were perhaps a little bit later than Swedenborg and then I've also come across a lot of friends in America who are linked to Christian science and I think that was probably was that later than Swedenborg yes that would be later but these were all mystics of their time so when, so I hadn't read about any of these people when I had my awakening I was just I'd um been to the College of Psychic Studies in London, which still exists and, and is full of these great books. And I know Swedenborg's books are in there. Yeah. And um, I was just levitating off my bed, being told all these things, 
I was doing this like hands-on healing on myself. And it was like, I was waking up the next day with more knowledge than I had the day before. But I'd been on a little psychometry course, which is where you hold inanimate objects and pick up information from jewelry from people. So all this was happening for me. And then I was starting to see people's past lives. And I thought, well, what use is that? And then my friend had told me about um, a psychic guy who was very, very good psychic. And I went to see him and he said, this, these are going to be your skills and gifts. You're going to work on TV. I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> and, um, you know, he was right. You know, I sat with this group of mediums and it was like the school of Hogwarts. And all of a sudden I was top of the class from being, you know, not particularly good at school in the academic world, yet probably Swedenborg would probably relate to this in a way that I was in the idiots class for maths, yet I ran the school tuck shop. So I obviously could add up, but not in the controlled square box way of adding up. So that happened to me very quickly. Very quickly, I was being shown all these mystical things are going to happen for me. And benevolent beings were speaking to me. Sometimes they would give me names in these channeled messages in the beginning. And they were from beings that we have known about. And there was a reference in the beginning to biblical names. That's what I was getting in the beginning. And angelic names. And all this knowledge and information they were giving me was beyond my frame of reference. And this was yeah. back in the early 2000s. And very quickly, I was being told, you're going to have to stand on a very big soapbox for what you believe in and speak your truth as you know it to be. And I didn't know what that was, but I inhabited, I think what Swedenborg is saying, I have inhabited this joy of the future as if it had already happened. And I was living in this state of joy and bliss as if the future had happened, not knowing what it was, but yeah. connecting with the vibration of what this future was. And very quickly, I ended up on um, TV in the UK on our main show called This Morning, which was a daytime ITV show. And I was brought on to just regress the hosts of the show into past lives, because by then I'd learned regression hypnotherapy into past lives, even though I could see people's past lives. Um, and so they said, can you come back every week till we make you your own show? So that was huge, like overnight being like catapulted into this, you know, reality of, yeah. even though I could see the past lives, I couldn't see what benefit that was going to be to people unless they could experience it. And it's, it's interesting now, because like, 20 odd years later, I work a lot on Skype and it is based on my intuition of me seeing people's not just past lives, but I call them emotional Akashic records, which is, from my perspective, the um, timeline of your experience and identifying in your timeline the origin of your emotional trauma and then taking you back to heal and release that emotional trauma. But with the clients, often, like I said, in the sessions, they're going back to the past lives. They're going back to what their thoughts and beliefs are in the past life at the point when their soul leaves their body. And we're reconciling that in this timeline now because all timelines coexist in what I've come to understand. So I'm intrigued in from Swedenborg's point of view, what he was saying about reincarnation and would he even use the terminology past lives or, or how would he reference reincarnation? Yeah, that so that term reincarnation wasn't around in e Europe and his time. As far as I know, I think that we we I think that, that came over from from Eastern philosophy. So he what he would talk about is what he would call spiritual heredity so just like you got physical heredity which is like why do i look like i look well, because of genetics it's because of the way that my ancestors lived for for thousands and thousands of years and, and the particular people in my past that you know that their genes are are in me in some way like I was, so um he said that there's a spiritual equivalent to heredity that that the, the things that make up our spirit and our tendencies um our our sort of proclivities to positive and negative things uh, not it doesn't dictate like what you think and how you feel but it it sort of lays the initial the, the initial landscape so so you'll tend towards those kinds of things that that 
you can trace back generation to generation because that just like physical things are passed on and you can do like a 23 and me right oh oh where where am I, where have my ancestors live where there there's a spiritual equivalent of that um we we have we did a, a show about sort of the processes that he talks about going on in the spiritual world where you have these like cyclings and things um so yeah there's there's not the same terminology but there's a lot of fascinating um insight he gives into just how connected you are not only to the past but to the spiritual community that you're in right now so like you you you're never alone spiritually that and 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 actually because of the na- you, you're just like your body's somewhere like i'm i'm sitting in an office right now we have a spirit well your spirit is somewhere it's not just it's not just in the cloud it, it's somewhere and so where you are where your spirit is spiritually affects who you are because you have this community of spirits that you're in and even even their thoughts and feelings can in the spiritual world thoughts and feelings are are much more transmissible they're they're like they kind of radiate out from you and so you can be affected by what's around you you can be affected by what came before you so we are so much more communal than you you can just think i'm i'm just a single being that that's never been affected by anything but there's this whole grand um it re- really we are citizens of of the human race and he just showed this cool backstory to that i wonder if that ties in because a lot of the work that i do which i didn't want to do it just evolved <laughs> out of what i do is i deal with <laughs> entities a lot which i'm sure he would call spirits um, yeah. I find that they attach to people in the work that I do. Often I'm helping people who maybe in this reality, they'd be told they had multiple personalities, like these different personalities come through them. Whereas right. I would say that's an entity that's attached to you in the work that I do, which there isn't that many people that work on the level I do. Um, like there's the Spirit Releasement Foundation, but they seem to have a slightly different approach than how I do it. Because I found out the the cohesion to the human was their emotion. Um, so that's why I'm intrigued with what Swedenborg was saying, whether he'd figured that out, which was the emotion is the cohesion. So when I take the person back to release this entity in a non-religious way, because how religion does it is like, you know, shouting at them. And... Yeah. Um, I have I've attracted recently a lot of Sikh clients because they have an understanding that entities can attach to you in the Indian Sikh culture. So um, when I when we work to release that, although a lot of my clients are are Westerners, um, they realize once they have the experience, they have to go back to the day the entity attached to them. And that can be in a past life. And it can be in this lifetime and we resolve it emotionally and they see in their, you know, session when their eyes are closed, they see the entity leaving them and then their personality or sometimes their health is improved by releasing this entity. So I wonder, although he wouldn't have, Swedenberg isn't going to use probably the same vocabulary as me, but he would, did he reference that? All the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. So whenever spirits approached him they would attach to a certain part of his body oh yes and this was like where his knowledge of anatomy came in and he could kind of tell what sort of spirits they were by what part of the body they corresponded to or attached so he would say certain spirits would come in and they would attack i would feel like a a pain in my jaw when, when they came and and they would absolutely affect how he would think and feel so he would say there's certain spirits that and he would tell you why. So that, that's because these are people who when they were alive, they spent their they, they thought physical sort of hedonistic pleasure was all that mattered. And they spent their whole time on that. So when they come and attach to me, they make me they, they make my mind get so dull that I can barely pay attention to my writing. And and he would also he would talk all the time about how they affect, they caused pain in different parts of his body. So to him, entities um affecting how you think and feel absolutely it's just like it's not that different from how we are just in the physical world relationships that you have what kind of social media you're looking at what shows you're watching that affects you it affects how you think and feel and what kind of foods you're eating the the intake that you have affects you is this another layer to it there's this spiritual layer to it that there's that uh, that that's one of his 
primary messages. And and what was really helpful to me when I was in my anxiety and depression is that the root causes of things that are going on in your heart and mind can be spiritual. And knowing that, and for, for me to, oh, these negative thoughts, like they're not mine. They're not just here because they're mine or they're true. It could just like the example I love to use is um, my my phone, my cell phone. Most of the time when it rings, I don't answer it because I know that it's a spam call. I don't know if you get it. This the same amount in Europe, but in America, it's like, it's just all these calls from numbers I don't know. And if you ever pick it up, it's just, uh, it's a robo call where somebody's saying, we're, we're trying to reach you about the warranty that's gonna expire on your car, but it's not real. It's just a scam to get you to put in your information. So I know, because I know that, I can say, well, I'm just not gonna answer this. It's the same kind of thing with, oh, I'm getting these th thoughts that I'm I'm worthless and life isn't going to turn out well. And it's just a spam. It's just a spam call. And, and knowing that that it came, knowing that it's just what the only reason I believe that the phone could be doing these spam calls is I understand, oh, there's just these programs people set up. They're trying to get money. I understand the backstory. So if you understand the backstory of how you're where your negative thoughts and feelings come from, that lets me just actually release them. Yeah, and I, I've got it even, I agree with you. We don't maybe get as many spam calls. We may be on our home phones, which some of us still have home phones. Yeah, in. yes. I like to play with it, right? So if I get a spam call and my house, somebody called Mrs. Orr must have lived here at some point. <laughs> they ring and ask about Mrs. Orr and I say... Oh, Mrs. Mrs. Orm has ascended to the Pleiades now. She's not in physical incarnation. And, <laughs> and with that, they slam the phone down on you. And they're going, oh, when they're telling you, trying to sell you house insurance, again, yeah. I play the game with them. So I say, why would I need house insurance? I'm not a vibrational match to my house catching on fire. And it, they're like, but how do you know that? I go, because I have cleared my mind to make sure that I'm not a vibrational <laughs> match to that. And that they have a total meltdown and they have to get rid of you. <laughs> like, you don't have to get rid of them, they get rid of you. Right, they, exactly. They, I think what Swedenborg was realizing was what you're realizing and I'm realizing is the impeccability of your mind to become impeccable with your mind changes your outer reality. Yeah. Yep. I, I love it. I love that example of you just, you, you're saying where you are and then the spam cars are like, well, I can't inhabit there. It's just like Swedenborg would say that when when you're in the what I talked about before, heaven, the state of the joy in doing what's useful for others, it's like that atmosphere, the negative stuff can't can't breathe in it. So it's like the more you become like that, the more it's just like, oh yeah, you, you if you, if you you can't just climb to the top of a mountain, you're not acclimated to it. You can't breathe up there. It's kind of like the negativity can't breathe around that kind of love and positivity. So it's great. Yeah, and I like to think, you know, going back to what I said to you at the beginning of how um, the Swedenborg Foundation contacted me, I like to believe, like, what are the chances of contacting me? Like you said, not many people know about Swedenborg. What are the chances of contacting someone who knows about Swedenborg and has had someone compare her birth chart to Swedenborg? <laughs> and, you know, not that I'm born at the same time of year as him, but but the astrologer in Sweden thought there were a lot of similarities in our, in our birth charts. Yeah. And also that you contacted me on the day that it was, his birthday but nobody from the foundation said oh we're contacting you on the day of his birthday but I just <laughs> right. went and researched it and, and thought oh my god here's another sign so I like to believe okay that Swedenborg wherever he is now has somehow constructed our connecting <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you Swedenborg yeah and, and I like to think that you perhaps knew him in a past life that would be great I, I, he seems like a great guy. So I, I'm I'm hoping he's happy about what we're doing here. Yeah, because from my perspective, like, why would you have such a passion for him and his work if you didn't have some soul connection to him in some other lifetime? I definitely like when I'm reading his material and the the way that it describes life, it just feels like... Ah, like I'm home. This is this is right. So yeah, I've I've got some kind of deep connection to that for sure. Yeah, and it and it might not even be necessarily from 
and it might be it might be from his incarnation as Swedenborg or it might be from his other incarnations that he might have been also yeah right it's uh I, I, so I can't wait to figure it out yeah <laughs> I, I can't wait to have what, what you had when you're holding the angel's hand and it shows you this is why everything happened this is the good that comes out of everything I'm I'm very excited for getting a few of those uh explanations myself yeah you'll have if I'm in if I'm in the US or, or you're in the UK you'll have to come and have a session because when I take people to this into life state and not everybody has this experience because um, I had a lady come once and she got to my doorstep and she was like, your flowers are dead outside in your pot. And I was like, oh, she's going to be difficult. Please let her be able to see her past lives and, you know, have the experience of why she's coming. Because I did this on TV, I suppose I had a different experience because someone who would be doing regression in general would get people who are on a deeply mystical path and have been on this path for a while but what I like in some ways was I got people who were just watching tv and from being exposed to this week after week after week thought I'm gonna go and see that lady or I'm gonna go and have an experience yet they hadn't read any mystical books so I was really their first port of mystical experience so when yeah. this lady I took her to the interlife state where she was connecting with angelic beings or a guide she couldn't see it as that she was going like this in the regression and I said what's happening she had a very annoying man is trying to touch me and so <laughs> um, what I was shown was her state of consciousness created what she was experiencing she couldn't see it as a benevolent being she saw it as an annoying being so the state that you inhabit may explain that and then I've had other clients start laughing and I'm sure Swedenborg would agree with this and they just got oh my god it's a play we're just actors in a play and then they start laughing because they see the totality of their whole life that it that it's a play and they're having all these experiences and it's really your free will emotionally how you choose to react with all this yeah that's it's so funny where the oh this annoying man is trying to poke me <laughs> i think about like uh with my daughter i'm saying hey you can't do that right now you've got to do this and i'm and i'm doing it for her own good but in the moment i'm sure i seem like just this annoying guy that's, that's <laughs> saying no you can't sorry you can't have another piece of cake right now um, but, but just like she's this angel is trying to help her and she's like, ah, get away from me. What are you doing? Because if you don't understand what they're doing, it can seem like that. So I love that. <laughs> yeah. And, and allowing people their free will. Well, I'm definitely going to go and read some of Swedenborg's. I, I, I have to pronounce it Swedenborg. I That's think great. I've been that for so long. Um, I'm really going to go and read some of his work. And where would you say is the best place to read his work? Yeah. So, um, if you go to Swedenborg.com, that's our website. We have all of his, well, most of his books available for free if you download the PDF or the ebook. And um, if you go to youtube.com slash off the left eye, that's our channel. We have over a thousand videos on there, which is taking Swedenborg's material, which for some people it is it's dense and hard to get into. And we we make it easy to access. So we have a bunch of videos there. But between those two resources, you should be set. Thank you. And if anyone's interested in in my work and what I'm sharing, I've got a YouTube channel with lots of free videos. I love Facebook and I have my website, which the link will probably be below, which is andreafaux.com. And I'll put a link to the Swedenborg Foundation below as well. So thank you so much, Curtis. I've really enjoyed our sharing. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much for having me. And it was great to get to meet you. And you as well. Much love. Many blessings. <laughs> Bye.